we are stronger than I. And welcome back to the Movement Warrior, our mission to leave Earth better than we found it. And I find no better way to do that than to discuss my favorite topic on the entire planet, and that's philosophy. Today we're going to be going into the story of philosophy written by one of my most favorite authors, Mr. Will Durant. And it's interesting, it's exciting, and it's sad all at the same time. If you've read A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking, you hear him lament, much like Nietzsche did during his time, that philosophy is dead and it's been replaced by science. Right? Just like Nietzsche said, God was dead. Right? I don't believe either of those men said that triumphantly. I think it was an observation of the reality and that there was a loss of a piece of what makes us human, uh, both in faith in God and in philosophy. But tonight I want to read a few excerpts. We're going to be focusing on um, Plato, believe it or not. Uh, don't know how long this will go. Just want to share some interesting thoughts from what I've read. I can't recommend this book enough. In fact, funny story. I, uh, my mom every year asks me, like, dude, what do you want for Christmas when Christmas rolls around? I'm like, mom, the stuff I want costs too much to ask other people to buy it for me. Like, I'm good. She's like, no, tell me what it is. I say, okay, if you want to get me one thing, go on my Amazon, look at my wish list, my book wish list, and you'll see all the books that I want. But one book in particular, it's a series of books called The Story of Civilization by Will Durant. And I've wanted this series for such a long time. And I'm a collector of books. I don't know if I've ever discussed that with you guys because many of you know that I collect video games. But I don't know that, I don't think I've actually explained that I also collect books. So you'll often find when I'm holding up books that I'm reading in videos, they're these weird old hardcover books. And that's because that's what I prefer. One, I prefer hardcover books because I'm just, I'm heavy handed, man. I break stuff, right? That's kind of been one of the running jokes of my family and friends is that since I was a kid, I break a lot of stuff. Um, interestingly enough, my Xbox 360 was one of the last ones out of everyone I knew to Red Ring of Death. But she goes on there, she sees, the, and I said, Mom, the, the book series, the one I want, because I don't want paperback, this is, this is going to go in my, you know, one of my, one of the three material possessions I want in my entire life that aren't cheap are uh, a two-story library, like you see in those old <laughs> films where the, they go to Sherlock Holmes' house and he's got this, you got to get on the ladder to get to the books, because I, I'm collecting books, I'm reading three books a week. The library I have now is much smaller <laughs> than the one I had in my old office uh, as I gave that entire, I gave the entire floor actually because a lot of that floor was my office where you guys used to see me shoot videos uh, and I gave that space, you know, with the fireplace and everything to my kids so they would have, um, you know, more rooms for them to sleep in as they're getting bigger and I took uh, one of the rooms upstairs that's much smaller so my library right now is split up between down there and up here. But I want to have a giant library because right now I can't even fit all my books uh, in it. But the idea is I want to have that library uh, and I collect books. And so my mom goes on there and says, oh, yeah. And I said, it's not cheap, yo, because I want the old hardbacks. Uh, she got it for me, believe it or not. Uh, and she, you know, my mom is is a beautiful soul of a person who always goes the extra mile for other people. She also noticed that the story of philosophy was on my list. And so she picked that one up, too, because as I was opening the gift, because uh, she couldn't wrap. It's 11 books and they're huge. She just put them all in a bag and let me go through it. Um, but in the in the bag was also this book that I'm going to be reading from tonight, along with another copy of the old school, The Lessons of History, because the copy I had, the cover was all ripped up and she knew that. So she got me another like almost new, but they're not new because they're old. They're out of print like a, a like new copy of the lessons of history, which is an amazing book. So now I have one that's got all my highlights in it and I have one that's clean, <laughs> but then she also got me the story of philosophy, which is a phenomenal book that I'm only about a third of the way through, or maybe I'm, I might be a little bit further than that now, but I want to talk with you tonight. We're going to get into a little bit of what Will says here in the beginning, and then we're going to get into some of the things that Plato says. And I'm going to give you my thoughts on them and, and relate them to kind of our mission here uh, as this daily life strategy and business strategy uh, for warrior entrepreneurs. 
Right. And in fact, one of the first things I'm going to read from Plato is going to be a direct thing I want to teach you all about business so that you can understand how to adjust and to pivot and to be adaptable in a market that's always evolving. You know, a lot of things about markets never change, but a lot of things do. And you have to understand those things. Uh, but that's the story. My mom got me this story of philosophy. And I, like I've, I've read so much. I see myself in a lot of these characters. You know, I see myself in Socrates a lot. I see myself uh, in Aristotle a ton. Uh, but I really see myself in Francis Bacon and um, Spinoza. Just, wow, some of the stuff they came up with. It's like I'm reading, I'm reading a more ancient, more wise version of myself. Like a lot of these men, like confirming beliefs that I've always had, but I'm hearing it from people way smarter than me. All right, so let's go to the book. Right here in the introduction, Will Durant greets us with, So let us listen to these men ready to forgive them their passing errors and eager to learn the lessons which they are so eager to teach. Do you then be reasonable? Said old Socrates to Crito. And do not mind whether the teachers of philosophy are good or bad, but think only of philosophy herself. Try to examine her well and truly, and if she be evil, Seek to turn away all men from her. But if she be what I believe she is, then follow her and serve her and be of good cheer. Now, he just, in that one little paragraph, and that's that's the intro, like the introduction is much longer than that, but that's the last paragraph leading you into the, the core of the book. And it's just, so let us listen to these men ready to forgive them their passing errors. Like one of the things we are so bad at in modern society and i think we probably sucked at it too during will durant's time uh when i say his time I mean, he's from our era of the world i think he passed away i want to say i'm not sure when he passed away but it wasn't terribly long ago but we're so quick to judge the material based on the person who's saying it. Where you could have somebody who's saying something incredibly wise and profound, right? And because you hate the person who's delivering it, you can't accept the message. And I, I think that is that's that st will stifle your growth so much because you're inevitably going to come across someone that you disagree with, but that has information that you don't have. Like I remember. Uh, when Donald Trump was running for office and one of the things they were like crapping on him about was this real estate university he had <laughs> that supposedly was hustling people and taking their money. But when I talked to people uh, or heard from people that actually took the course, they're like, yo, I learned a ton. Like I make millions of real estate and I took that course. That course was dope. <laughs> and they weren't Trump fans. They were liberals. They were like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're so quick to judge people and, and by the way it's not your fault you know if you've watched my series which i know you haven't because about 500 people have watched it <laughs> total if you watch my series on the 25 cognitive biases on youtube um, one of the biases i talk about is the disliking and hating tendency right meaning we tend to not accept information from people we don't like even if the information is correct uh, and i just think we got to get better about that Right. And he says, do you then be reasonable, said Socrates to Crito, and do not mind. And he's not asking him, do you then be reasonable? He's saying, do you then be reasonable? And do not mind whether the teachers of philosophy are good or bad. Right. But think only of the philosophy. Examine what's coming out of the person's mouth objectively outside of the context of who's delivering it because i'm telling you guys some of the allies that you're going to need and want in this world are going to be people that you do not necessarily like that much and if you can be objective if you can know that you have a disliking and hating tendency in your brain that says i don't like this person so i can't listen to them stop and listen to them you might be surprised if you can listen with that objective ear what you can learn and what you can take away. Right? Think only of philosophy yourself. Try to examine her. And, and if the philosophy be bad, if it be evil and it's steering us the wrong way, then run and lead men and women away from her. 
And then he says, but if she be what I believe she is, then follow her and serve her. And I agree 100% with that. I think this type of discourse needs to come back. And I, I fear that social media <laughs> is part of the kind of one of the last nails in the coffin of ph philosophical discussion. Because everything now is arguing and debating and people taking sides. And, you know, I think it was either Charlie Munger or... or um, Warren Buffett that says never argue with someone unless you know their argument and can argue their points better than they can because if you haven't examined the other side thoroughly like thoroughly and I don't mean in a bias like I'm gonna find everything that's wrong with this person I didn't know find what's right with it I encourage people to do that all the time like I have I have friends who are, you know, very, very, very liberal. And then I have friends who are just straight up conservative. And I tell both of them, look at the other side and find 10 things that are right with it. Find 10 things you like about Trump. Then I'll listen to you argue about how terrible he is. Right? And I tell the conservative the same thing. Find, I want you to find 10 things the Democrats are doing right now that you absolutely love. Then I'll listen to your rant about how all liberals are evil and all this other bs that people think right because they don't research their points right listen without judgment is what he was saying back to the book now we're into plato the war being over sparta demobilized her troops and suffered the economic disturbances natural to that process while athens turned her navy into a merchant fleet and became one of the greatest trading cities of the ancient world. Now, it's talking about in 490 to 470 BC, Spartan and Athens, forgetting their jealousies and joining their forces, fought off the effort of the Persians uh, under Darius and Xerxes, right, to turn Greece into the colony of the Asiatic Empire. So, the story of 300, right? So, when they finally drive Xerxes and all these and Darius away, um, you know, Sparta and Athens take actions after the war right sparta demobilizes their military much like america used to do right no standing army we just call the army up when it's time to go to war um, but they suffered economic disturbances because you just sent you know you've raised money to send these people into conflict and now they've come home and you've just disbanded them right well what can a warrior do but be a warrior Right. If you can't help them make the transition and the pivot from being a warrior to a functioning member of a civilian society, they're going to suffer the economic disturbances natural to that process. While Athens turned her navy into a merchant fleet, they used what they were already good at, which was navigation. Right. The navy are the navigators of the world. Right. We're already good at that. Now use your boats and use your weapons to protect yourself to help us do trade. You see what I mean? So in your business, you need to start thinking about, or in your life, your career, whatever it is, think about how you can adapt, like especially for my veterans who are listening. How can you take what you learned as an 11 Bravo, right? Or an 11 Mike or an 11 Alpha or a 13 Bravo, right? Or a 13 Echo, right? Or a 13 Fox, right? Or a 12 Bravo. Like, what did you learn in those areas that you can transition into, a career beyond that. Well, I can tell you right now, um, a specialist in the army in some way, shape, some ways has more leadership experience than people I've seen work for 15 or 20 years in a corporation, right? 20 year old specialist, 21 year old specialist, 24 year olds for however old they are, <laughs> right? 21-year-old specialist, in some cases, has more management and leadership experience than, people, than seasoned professionals I've seen in the business world. So you got to learn how to transition that. Back to the book. They ask questions about anything, right? And so just so you understand what we're talking about, these are um, basically, they were all clever men. Georgius Hippas, for example. And many of them were profound. Protagoras, Prodicus. There is hardly a problem or a solution in our current philosophy of mind and conduct, which they did not realize and discuss. 
All right. And going back to the book, going back a little bit further. But the most characteristic and fertile developments of Greek philosophy took form with the sophists, traveling teachers of wisdom who looked within upon their own thought and nature rather than out upon the world of things. All right. They asked questions about anything. They stood unafraid in the presence of religious or political taboos and boldly subpoenaed every creed and institution to appear before the judgment seat of reason. And this is something that is lost in our society today. We so blindly believe everything that we were taught. No questioning. No challenging. Right? We just accept this to be true. You know, one of the things I hear my mostly liberal family talk about is all the republicans want is they hate the poor people and they, they just want to help the rich okay it's an interesting argument <laughs> it's an interesting standpoint uh does not sound very well researched right you know challenge these ideas that have been passed down for generation to generation to generation right in politics, they divided into two schools. One, like Rousseau, argued that nature is good and civilization bad, that by nature all men are equal, becoming unequal only by class-made institutions, and that law is an invention of the strong and a chain, um, and, oh, I'm sorry, law is an invention of the strong to chain and rule the weak. Another school, like Nietzsche, claim that nature is beyond good and evil, that by nature all men are unequal, that morality is an invention of the weak to limit and deter the strong, that power is the supreme virtue and the supreme desire of man, and that of all forms of government, the wisest and most natural is aristocracy. Now that would fly in the face of a lot of what we believe today in our republic, right? But there's still, by the way, there's still an aristocracy, let me be clear. Right. You don't believe me? Run for president. Run for president in this next term. See how far you get. Right. It's not that you are not allowed to run for president. Right. That's the myth of the republic. But uh, if you get elected, I'll be very surprised. Let's just say that. Right. So he's talking about differing philosophies here. But what I find in the most successful people on the planet is the ability to balance between these two, is the, the ability to balance between two opposing thoughts. Because usually in that polarity is where you find the truth. Right? Plato goes on to say, life without discourse would be unworthy of a man. And that's where I think we find ourselves today. You know, I, I look across social media. I look at what people are talking about, what they're sharing. You know, I always joke about the yoga pants and the bikini models and the, the, the influencers and all this stuff. And um, But there's also people out there telling really powerful stories, too. It's not just all the fluff that I tend to kind of whine about or whatever. But one of the things that I feel is missing is everyone's telling a story. But very few people are listening and discussing the story. Because that takes effort and that takes energy that we're too distracted to want to to do. And frankly, I think the platforms don't really encourage that. I'd say Facebook more than any of them does. Uh, and I tend to attract the type of audience that do want to discuss things at a deeper level. Um, but... I feel like there needs to be more. Like, we need to discuss things instead of shouting. Things. Like, just go on Twitter and look at political. It's not a discussion. It's two opposing beliefs screaming, not even at each other, because neither person is listening to the other one, except for listening for ways to find a flaw in your argument so I can yell something back at you to make you feel stupid. Right? And that's not effective. You know, the, the nature of politics is combative. Right, But the combative nature of it in its original form was to take two opposing ideas and to find the truth in the middle. Now it's just everybody is on the polar opposites and everybody over here is a bigot and everybody over here, um, you know, is a socialist or whatever words we're using to levy at these folks. And because there's no discourse, there's just, you know, a handful of tribes yelling at each other in, a, in, a, um, in an echo chamber. Not a whole lot of uh, not a whole lot of wise thought or action coming out of that. 
<laughs> Here's a funny piece about Socrates back to the book. He was not so welcome at home, for he neglected his wife and children. And from Xanthippe's point of view, he was a good-for-nothing idler who brought to his family more notoriety than bread, right? And so they're talking about Socrates, who's revered as this awesome person. Uh, I think that's Socrates. I think they adjusted here from talking about Plato in that part of the book. Um, yeah, they were talking, because Socrates was Plato's me uh, mentor. But it's interesting. You know, I'd, I'd tell creators and influencers that I coach or that I work with all the time that... <laughs> You, know, you get so frustrated, like, I only have, you know, 10,000 subscribers or followers. And I'm like, well, Socrates' his own wife didn't like him. Like, he wasn't all that popular when he was doing his thing. <laughs> He's popular now, right? And hopefully you get popular before you're dead, but it's just interesting. And, and one of my favorite, 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 favorite quotes... Uh, Back to the book here. It says, It was said that the oracle at Delphi, with unusual good sense, had pronounced him, Socrates, the wisest of the Greeks, and he had interpreted this as an approval of the agnosticism, agnosticism, which was the starting point of his philosophy. And his philosophy was thus, One thing only I know, and that is that I know nothing. One thing only I know, and that is that I only know nothing. One thing only I know, and it's that I know nothing. All right? That takes a lot of, I think that takes a lot of balls to say that. Because here you are, this, you're seen by the Oracle of Delphi, for God's sake, as the wisest among your people. And then you tell the whole audience, I don't know anything. All right? But that that's such a, if we get really honest with ourselves, how many things do we believe in our day-to-day -day lives that we know without any shadow of a doubt is true right like gravity we know that one's in there um the laws of inertia those are pretty well established right but think about the things we're biased about that we we believe in our hearts are the absolute truth but how can you know something without experiencing it Right. You believe leprosy is bad, and you probably know it's bad because there's been a lot of examples of people dealing with leprosy. That's like, you know what? I don't need to get leprosy to know it sucks because there's a lot of documentation passed down from even biblical stories of people struggling with this weird sickness. It, it sucks. You know, the book goes on to say Socrates believed in one God. The same guy that says, I know nothing, believes in one God. And hoped in his modest way that death would not quite destroy him. But he knew that a lasting moral code could not be based upon so uncertain a theology. If one could build a system of morality absolutely independent of religious doctrine, as valid for the atheist as it is for the pietist, then theologies might come and go without loosening the moral cement that makes of willful individuals the peaceful citizens of a community. On the con and this is moving a little bit forward in the book, he says, on the contrary, it is not universally seen that men in crowds are more foolish and more violent and more cruel than men separate alone. And he asked that as a question. And then I have a picture of Will Durant with his, uh, looks like his daughter. It's an awesome picture, by the way, too. And here's one. Here's a really interesting quote going back to the book. The rest of the story, all the world knows. For Plato wrote it down in prose more beautiful than poetry. We are privileged to read for ourselves that simple and courageous, if not legendary, apology or defense, in which the first martyr of philosophy proclaimed the rights and necessity of free thought, upheld his value to the state and refused to beg for mercy from the crowd whom he had always contemned they had a power to pardon him he disdained to make the appeal it was a singular confirmation of his theories that the judges should wish to let him go while the angry crowd voted for his death had he not denied the gods woe to him who teaches men 
faster than they can learn. You see this story get repeated in uh, the biblical story of Jesus. And that's where I want to put a pause in here because I, I want to dive into that before I let you all go today, tonight, whenever you may be listening to this. Woe to him who teaches men faster than they can learn. And I think, oh, and here's another quote. The strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Oof, that is powerful. Wow. Here's one that backs up something I said <laughs> in a previous podcast. The state is what it is because it's citizens or nation in our case. You got to remember these were much smaller societies than we live in today. The state is what it is because its citizens are what they are. Therefore, we need not expect to have better states or nations until we have better men. Till then, all changes will leave every essential thing unchanged. You know, so you guys hear me say that a lot. It's like if you want better politicians, like people complain about, you know, Hillary and Trump and all that. Like, well, if you want better people than Hillary or Trump running for and then winning and running the office, then we have to become better people. We have to, like all the things you accuse them of, right? Being dishonest, being narcissistic. We have to become less narcissistic, less deceitful. Because when we become that, the sentinels of your society, the politicians, is what those are, they're supposed to be. They don't much resemble sentinels these days. But it's because we don't. Your sentinels are going to be and carry the values that you have. Because it's the only way they can get elected is by speaking in a way that you understand. And this, this quote here that I read that I wanted to stop on, Woe to him who teaches men faster than they can learn. You know, I made a comment to my doctor in a therapy session one time. I was talking about how I was reading a lot of ancient philosophy. Uh, and when I combine what I'm starting to understand in philosophy and history with what I've read about our biology and our evolutionary psychology. And, you know, you look at um, Aristotle went on to say later in this book, and we'll, we'll definitely get to him uh, in one of these talks. Aristotle said uh, later in this book that, you know, once a state goes above 10,000 people, it becomes a nation. And it becomes very challenging to run a nation simply because you're going to, mathematically, you're going to have a large pool of differing values. And when people have differing values because of the cognitive state that we're in currently as humans, we're very tribal, we're very fearful, we're extremely uh, emotionally driven. We don't apply much reason to the things we believe, even though we think we do. We think it's reasonable. You know, my conservative buddy thinks it's reasonable to be conservative, just like my liberal family and other people in my life think it's reasonable to be liberal. Where the reasonable man usually looks at both extremes and says, well, both of you are insane. And I'm not talking about my family or my friend because they're not at the extremes, but it's, you know, they look at the extremes and say, well, that's crazy. The answer's got to be somewhere closer to the middle. But most of us can't do that. And when you have a nation of 300 million people, you know, even if, and I've seen politicians try to speak in a more intelligent way about the issues that we always get caught up in, you know, the, the issues that have been political issues now for the last 20 years, um, you know, and I'm not saying they're not issues. I'm just saying they get oversimplified and they get oversimplified because we are simple-minded in the way we approach things. We're emotional and simple-minded. And when the comment I made to my to my uh, therapist was, I don't know that the American... Like, the American, American experiment is working very, very well um, in light of how terrible things could be with 300 million people. Like, the fact that we're not beating each other in the streets every day it means that we've built something... Uh, and I believe it's the f the fundamental foundations of our Constitution that have, that have laid out our best understanding of freedom to date. And uh, I think the the writers, somehow inspired by God or what have you, found a way to communicate about freedom in a way that motivated people to put 
their differences aside, at least to a certain extent. And so the comment I made to my therapist was, but we still have challenges. We still, you know, things are somewhat volatile. And people say, no, it's extremely volatile. I'm like, no, World War I is extremely volatile. <laughs> you know, World War II is extremely volatile. These wars that we fought for the last 20 years in, in you know, Southwest Asia, that's really volatile. What's going on here in America is slightly uncomfortable. Um, but I think Aristotle points to a, a very specific challenge, which is, you know, he doesn't say it this way because there was no evolutionary psychology back in his day. But the way I say it is we're just not cognitively evolved enough to get along much better than we do with 300 million people. You know, it takes a willingness to see somebody else's side of the argument, no matter how ridiculous or bigoted or angry or racist or whatever you think it is. It takes a willingness to see the other side. Right? And sometimes what you find on the other side is evil and it needs to be dealt with, right? But I just, you know, I told my ther my, my doctor, I just said, you know, I, I don't think the American experiment can run at 100% efficiency and effectiveness until we've had about a million years more of cognitive evolution. Which is part of the, when I tell you guys, welcome back to the movement, that's part, I am trying to accelerate that process. When you boil down all the things that I'm working on in media and working with veterans and, and working with all of you, I'm really trying to accelerate cognitive evolution. I think we do have it in our hands even to change our, our, our genes to a certain extent if we become more diligent about how we study and what we study. Right, and how we consume information and how we can get control. You know, Napoleon Hill teaches about this, about how you can control your mind. But it takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy that a person who's distracted by four hours of television or YouTube uh, or Netflix flix binging is not going to be able to do. So I, I kind of have been this uh, kind of voice in the wilderness, gently nudging people to say, hey, listen. If we want things to be better, we've got to get better. And the answers aren't on Netflix. Right? Or at the very least, they're not on the shows that people are frequenting on Netflix. But this quote here, Woe to him who teaches men and women faster than they can learn. Um... I have struggled with this challenge. Uh, like if you look at the way I, I teach my kids, sometimes I get too far out ahead of where they are cognitively. And it causes me frustration. Um, not that I take out on them, obviously, but it's like, oh yeah, I got to remember this dude's five. He's not going to get this. Like I want it. Like I want my kids to, to have wisdom and have joy and curiosity. And they do. And it's sometimes when I'm teaching, like I am, like I don't teach it, you know, I, I've worked in the school system before, but I remember I worked as a substitute teacher for kindergarten years and years and years ago. And uh, this is when I was still in college. And um, I just realized working with those kids, like, yeah, this isn't my calling. I don't, I don't have the... <clears throat> nurturing spirit that it takes to exercise the patience to work with a child who you have to repeat things to at least, you know, 700 times. And adults are really not much different. Like there's things I've said for years and years and years and years and then finally it starts to catch on with people. The difference is I can still reason with an adult in ways that I can't. Like my, I took uh, some of my boys out today. We all went to work out together and then we went to hang out together and had dinner together and uh the youngest of that group just he could not sit still he was climbing under the tables and climbing on stuff and interrupting people's sentences and i just had to keep reminding myself he's a little dude he doesn't get it he's not he doesn't he's doing the best he can with where he is 
And I just have to be patient with them. I just got to do that. And it's hard for me, right? And so sometimes it's like, woe to the man who teaches people faster than they can learn. Now, when you do that with adults, you know, you end up being Jesus Christ. Because the concept he was trying to get across to these people was you took what was intended as a system of freedom and and democratized power and you've turned it into a centralized power source and a form of control uh, i.e religion and you see this get repeated in in catholicism um you see this pattern repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat where it's we want to use these spiritual teachings to control people when the intent of these spiritual teachings was freedom right i, I don't think in the like the myth the story of Adam and Eve, those two people could have ever been free completely living in that garden. Because what would they be what would they be free from? Right? I think it was a setup for God to demonstrate what it takes to become like him. He created us like him, but then there's a growth process that we have to go through to become him. Which, I, which is his ultimate goal, uh, is that we become, you know, Jesus even said that later to his boys. He says, now I don't call you servants, I call you friends. Well, that's what, you know, a God, a scripture that called, God called Abraham a friend, Moses a friend, right? Not just servants, equals. Right? And that's hard for people to wrap their head around because they've got this false humility that's been taught for years by systems that want to control people. You know, it's one of the reasons, like, when I talk to a fundamentalist Christian, and they'll say, every word in the scripture is 100% accurate. I'm like, well, even the part where David said, God made us a little lower than the angels, that's completely incorrect. It's because it was translated and written by a group of people who had a lot of false humility. And I, by the way, I get what they're saying. They're saying that the spirit of what's written there is accurate, even though it's written by fallible men. Um, but, you know, it's just interesting. Right, it was Jesus was trying to get over to these people that guys that there's a better way. Love each other, love one another, as you love yourselves. And he had to say, as you love yourselves, because you guys have spent centuries up to this point beating the hell out of yourselves, trying to make yourself acceptable to God. And then he teaches them the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of the Spirit is life. The free gift. He was trying to get across to them. You're trying to earn your freedom and your 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 life of freedom. When I'm trying to tell you, it's not something that you beat yourself or law yourself into earning. It's something that you just accept, All right? And then before him, you had Moses who was teaching these kids. Like Jesus Christ, I, I don't know how Moses survived with those people as long as he did. Like, there would have been murders in the camp if I had been Moses. <laughs> I'm just like, this guy's got to go. That's probably why I'm not Moses. And you know, obviously, it's not true. I'm joking. But it's, he was trying to get across to them. Like, you don't have to live like oppressed people anymore. We can be free in our minds. And that freedom of mind can lead to freedom in existence. And so there's been teachers for centuries and millennia trying to get this across to people but we just prefer it's like cypher in the matrix we prefer to be him it's like oh just put me back in the matrix dude it's easier yeah it's easier but the hard is what makes things good you know i told my therapist that in a session one time recently you know i was in a group therapy session and my doctor was there and you know, we were talking to people about you know whatever we talk about and i had encouraged one of the young men there to do something and the doctor quickly says yeah but that's not so easy i said that you're right and it's the hard that makes it good for him right uh, nothing i'm suggesting to you all is easy but woe to you all if you would try to teach your people your audience your clients faster than they're capable of learning because doing that one is going to breed distrust and frustration you have to, and one of the musicians I worked with years ago taught me this. This guy named Jay is an awesome dude. He's actually a church pastor now. He taught me, he's like, B, you got to take people on the journey, man. You can't take them to the end of the story without telling them the story. And he's like, and I know that's hard for you because you're not a story guy. 
it's like you already know the end of the story and you want to hurry up and get people there but they're not there brother you got to take them on the journey they don't have the experience that you have and they don't have the perspective that you have so in order for them to get that perspective they still have to go through their journey he was teaching me woe unto you you're trying to teach people faster than they're able to learn and that's what i'll leave you all with man pray you got something great out of that if you need something you know where to find me thank you so much for subscribing remember always that we're stronger than i love you dearly and i'll see you tomorrow i'll see you tomorrow i'll see you tomorrow i'll see you tomorrow